History is full of amazing stories and memorable people. But we don't care about them. No hits, deep tracks only. Some of the most influential people in the world have been completely overlooked or just plain forgotten. We are digging deep into the history books to bring you their stories. And maybe some laughs along the way. This is History's B-Side. Today's B-Sider is the British Bagpiping Badass. I thought we'd start out today's episode by playing a little game. Oh, great. <laughs> Have you ever played the Walmart game? Do you know what that is? I haven't. Is that I, I've heard of people playing like Marco Polo in Walmart at <laughs> one in the morning and shit like that, but No, it's not quite Marco Polo <laughs> in the aisles of Walmart. Um basically I, I've never actually played this game, but I've at least heard it as a joke. I guess you don't even really need to play it. It's more just like a conversation game, which is perfect for podcasting. Yeah. But if you go into Walmart and you can only buy three items, what three items would you buy to just freak out the cashier just to make them think something totally oh, weird about you or interesting like you were up to something i feel like i go one of two directions one would be like a violent direction and the other one would be a sexual direction yeah that's because the... like they sell guns so i feel like i would either have like a shotgun or like an abnormally my three items, can one of them be, like, a pile of one item? Uh, or can it just be like, one? Like a box of ammo? Or? Well, I'm thinking it, like, can't condoms. Like, I would <laughs> buy, like, 20 condoms. <laughs> I feel like that's those are the only two directions people go with this game is, like, something dangerous or violent or, like, weirdly sexual. I'm going to stick with sexual because I don't really know where I'm going with a shotgun. But I would get, like, as many condoms as I could purchase <laughs> in one box. A watermelon. <laughs> Gosh. And probably like a weird like mask from the kids toy section. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Either that or like a, <laughs> a toy sword or like a toy weapon from the kids toy section. I regret starting this episode this way. Um, I could just be a sexually active father who likes watermelon. <laughs> just buying a kid for my toy, some food. I staying safe. was trying to think of a way to go with this that wasn't either of those two directions. Well, I don't know why you started this conversation with me. Because <laughs> you know I was going to take it in one of those two directions. I See, I was trying to think of something like just really goofy, like yeah. balloons and, I don't know, Nerf guns. and But that's not really going to Here's the thing. We're out, doing but... this at Walmart. It's not like you're doing this at, I don't know, American Eagle like you it's walmart you really have to try to freak these people out <laughs> yeah they work at walmart <laughs> you can't just buy goofy <laughs> things surprising there exactly anymore. yeah i don't know i i guess i would have to think on that a little bit more as if i didn't have any time to prepare for this episode but <laughs> for something that wouldn't be just like horrible or horrible in a different way <laughs> but Ooh, i guess that's kind of the point of the you could you could buy like i don't know how many of these ingredients walmart sells but you could buy like the ingredients for meth and then like a beaker <laughs> and a need, funnel what is it what's like sudafed <laughs> <laughs> i don't know them phil isn't it sudafed that you like have to be a certain age to buy and can only buy a certain amount you can make something out of sudafed i don't know if it's meth it may, might be <laughs> we're really showing our background on drug knowledge here which is not very much history's b-side does not produce support sell or yeah. use we do not meth. condone any form of the walmart game that involves meth <laughs> violence horrible sexual activity or making drugs i just don't approve of violence and making drugs but <laughs> you can cut them out. we're not here to kink shame <laughs> exactly <laughs> all right so let's maybe go a different direction of <laughs> this game um sort of like desert island i guess you only get three items but rather than i guess being stranded on a desert island you are taking three items into battle if you were into battle yeah if you were in the military and you were Heading into battle and you could only take three items, what would you take? Three items that exist today. Anytime in history. Right. Three real items 
in any point in history. So I was just having the conversation about the desert island thing because me and my dad were talking about Naked and Afraid, that TV <laughs> show, and whether or not we would do it and what we would bring. But I feel like if I was going into battle, is it assumed that I have clothes? Doesn't matter. There's just a naked and afraid situation. I mean, naked okay, and at yes, war. You have your your military uniform. Okay, great. I would bring, I think, duct tape, a clean pair of socks, and <laughs> some kind of a weapon. Yeah, I would bring some sort of automatic weapon. I don't know enough about guns to like name the weapon, but an automatic weapon, of course, preferably with a scope. <laughs> Probably a knife, like a big hunting knife or a machete or some sort of like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bring like a large, like a samurai sword or anything like that, but like a, a, a cutting tool. And what else? Hmm. Am I going to like a long war or is this just a battle, like one battle? I don't know, man. Whatever you want. <laughs> Well, I was thinking of bringing a grenade, but I felt like that would only last so long. <laughs> it's a one-time use type Exactly. Thing. Um, this is hard. I don't know what I'd bring. I guess water. Yeah, I guess that's useful. All right. Well, today's main topic, <laughs> the reason I bring this up. It's not Walmart. <laughs> no. The, uh, the person we're talking about today was a soldier and spoiler alerts, it's a World War II episode. It's been like almost 10 weeks since yeah. we did a World War II episode. So I think we're due for one. Yeah. But it's not like the, the nazi world war ii episode like there's nothing horrible i don't feel that we need to talk about atrocities or anything too terrible in this Aww. episode <laughs> i know just started to disappoint i'm so happy today what is gonna <laughs> depress me before i go to sleep but today's b-sider was a soldier in world war ii who entered the war carrying only a broadsword interesting you mentioned carrying some kind of <laughs> blade but not a sword he had a broadsword <laughs> bagpipes and a longbow <laughs> i forgot to mention my saxophone that's i, I would bring that <laughs> yeah. to, to war you need your machete <laughs> your saxophone and i guess a gun yeah <laughs> or a bow but we're really I feel like you'd be outmatched that's why i picked an automatic weapon we're really not that far in the past here this is 1940s he's bringing a longbow to a gunfight <laughs> it's a, a little brave i feel like in in, in world war ii though i mean Oh, this guy was definitely kind of brave. I mean, we'll get into that a little bit. But also worth noting that while we are recording this in mid-May, I think it'll come out about mid-July, so peak of summertime, we're currently sitting out on my nice patio, so you might get some fun background noises of neighbor dogs barking or lawn mowing or whatever, so enjoy the, the sounds, ambiance of... The gentle sounds of chirping birds. What hopefully is nice weather in July when you're listening to this and... <laughs> Us enjoying nice weather in May. <laughs> All right. So as I mentioned, today's main topic was a soldier in World War II. And like I said, we don't really need to get into the full background of World War II on this episode. I feel like people get World War II. Like, you know what I mean? I feel like people understand enough about it to hear a story from it. Yeah. And this isn't like, I don't know. The last time we talked about World War II was the spiritual co-founder of Nazism. Like yeah. that had to do a lot with ideology and understanding kind of where the nazi party came from and everything like that whereas this one is just kind of like a it's more biopic about one specific guy and his really unique story mm -hmm. so i don't think we need to talk a whole lot about the history of world war ii and what went into it and what the two sides were and everything like that so right. we're just gonna gonna focus on his story so we're gonna start with his background a little bit and then section two of the episode today we'll get more into his actual role in world war ii and some of the stuff that he yeah. got into so today's b-sider is a man named john malcolm thorpe fleming churchill but he was better known <laughs> by his nicknames fighting jack churchill or just simply mad jack angry he's angry not angry mad more like crazy crazy mad <laughs> crazy mad <laughs> wild he's really just a really interesting guy and Putting it that way kind of <laughs> doesn't fully explain what all he got himself into. I'm excited. I'm excited yeah, to hear Yeah, this is a it. fun topic for sure. Mad Jack Churchill was born on September 16th, 1906 in Colombo, British Ceylon, which is present-day Sri Lanka. His father, Alec Fleming Churchill, 
held a senior administrative and engineering position with the British Colonial Service. So the family moved around a lot when they were real young. His family was actually native to Oxfordshire in England, but his given name kind of reflects an Anglo-Scottish ancestry. So he's kind of just from the UK, sure. but not necessarily inherently British. Right. So this might be a dumb question given what you just said, but is he related to Winston Churchill? That's kind of the first thing I thought when I saw his name. Yeah, he's not actually related to Winston Churchill at all, but that does kind of play a role in his story later on. Oh, interesting. Just having the similar <laughs> last name. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay. Were there a lot of people named Churchill? I mean, I, that might be a question. That... Yeah, I don't know that, but I would think it. I mean, it's a very English yeah, last yeah, name, like isn't it? Smith. <laughs> yeah. Like we have a lot of Washingtons now and mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I don't know that Churchill is necessarily like the most common last name in England, but it just has that very British sounding yeah. name that you would think that there's probably quite a few Churchills that weren't necessarily related. Soon after Jack was born, soon after Jack was, come on, Archie. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. That's fantastic and terrible all at the same time. I cannot believe that happened. Should we stop? I mean, yeah. I... It's a lot of noise on there. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, because that's not going to, that's the other thing. It's like, that's not going to stop. I mean, we could shut the windows and just sweat. What do you want to do? Move or sweat? Should we, like, keep recording or? Might as well. All right. Soon after Jack was born, his family moved back to England, specifically to Surrey, where his brother Thomas was born. But then in 1910, they moved again to British Hong Kong when his father was appointed to be the director of public works. His youngest brother, Robert, was born in Hong Kong, and the family again moved back to England mm. by 1917. Moving around like this and traveling around the world would continue to be a theme of Jack Churchill's life pretty much until he was done serving in the army. He received an education at King Williams College on the Isle of Man and the Royal Military College in Sandhurst. Upon his graduation, he was commissioned into the 2nd Battalion Manchester Regiment and served in Burma and India. In his spare time while serving in this region, he enjoyed riding his motorcycle and learning to play the bagpipes. <laughs> two, uh, two standard activities for young men. Yeah, pretty much. Who wouldn't be doing those in their spare time? <laughs> More specifically about those uh, hobbies. He once rode his Zenith motorcycle 1,500 miles across the Indian subcontinent. And at one point on this journey, he crashed into a water buffalo. <laughs> This is just on the road. Did it destroy his bike? I feel like crashing in a water buffalo with anything less than a car would, you know, pretty I solidly didn't totally like, look I didn't into this. Hear a whole lot about this story, but every article I read about him mentioned the fact that he drove his motorcycle into a water into buffalo. A water buffalo. It was like, yeah, while he was over there, he rode his motorcycle fifteen hundred miles and hit a water buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a very minor sub point, but like it was in every single article. <laughs> As for his bagpiping, he learned to play the bagpipes from the pipe major of the Cameron Highlanders, which is in Malaysia. It's a big bagpiping group and kind of inspired a lot of uh, future British style bagpiping Interesting. groups. <laughs> I don't know a lot about bagpiping. That's I don't either, experience. except for that one time a year when I have to start talking to bagpipe <laughs> bands for <laughs> my day job. <laughs> St. Paddy's Day. After completing his service in Burma and India, he was awarded the Indian General Service Medal with Burma Clasp. Why was he awarded? Was there, and did he have any like specific accomplishments that he was being honored for? Or? 
Uh, I'm not too sure on that. He receives a few more medals throughout his military service. This one specifically, there wasn't too much on why he earned it. I would assume just completing the the operation competently and sure. the way it was supposed to be done. After this service, he returned to England, but became bored with the army life. Anytime it wasn't active duty, he kind of just thought military life was boring. <laughs> so in 1936, he left the army and moved to Nairobi, Kenya, where he worked as a newspaper editor, a male model, and an actor. It's a real renaissance man, all these different yeah. jobs and hobbies. Just immediately qualified for everything. Yeah. It said that he had a very chiseled jawline, which is what got him the opportunities as a male model and an actor. But he was really just more in the background, like a, a background actor in a couple movies. Sure. He appeared in two movies early in his life. They were called The Thief of Baghdad and A Yank at Oxford. It was actually his bagpiping skills. And, you know, we haven't really talked about this too much yeah. yet, but he had archery skills. He knew how to shoot a bow and arrow. And that's what landed him these background roles in these movies. So were these like his modeling and acting career, those were in Kenya? Like was I, I just I guess I wasn't aware of like a big film presence in Kenya, but No, I mean these this was kind of a weird time in his life that it's not like super documented chronologically. Gotcha. The Thief of Baghdad was actually filmed in nineteen twenty four, so it was much earlier in his life when he was still living in England. Mm. And a Yank at Oxford I I looked up and it was filmed in nineteen thirty six, so it was around the time that he moved to Kenya, but I think it was also filmed still back in England. So this is just kind of like this gotcha. weird break when he left the army and kind of took on some other odd jobs before <laughs> eventually going back to army. He wasn't in Kenya too long. By 1938, he returned to England and he took second place in a military piping competition. So bagpipe <laughs> <Of> competition. <course. laughs> and he also represented Great Britain at the World Archery Championships in Oslo, Norway in 1939. Interesting. I didn't know there was a World Archery Championship. Makes sense. I mean, it's a I mean, sport. I, I'm not surprised. I'm more surprised at the piping competition oh, than yeah. the <laughs> World Archery Championships. I actually think I, I looked it up briefly and this was one of the earlier renditions of the World Archery Championships. I think it was only like in the first couple years of it and it still mm. continues on today. I don't think Jack Churchill fared very well <laughs> in the 1939 World Archery Championships, but he did represent Britain. He just finished somewhere not near the top. Come on, Jack. You got to practice, man. I mean, it's not really a knock against him. As we'll see, he was a skilled archer, but maybe just not on the day of the competition. Competition. <laughs> competition was a big uh, was a big pond for a little fish, maybe. So we can already see that he was kind of a unique soldier, so to say. <laughs> I think that's safe. <laughs> we'll take a short break here, and then we'll get more into... The story of Mad Jack Churchill and the role that he played in World War II. Matt, you like coffee, right? I love coffee. Would you ever want to buy me a coffee? Anytime, Phil. You just say the word. You know, our dedicated listeners could also buy me a coffee. Could they buy me a coffee as well? They could buy you a coffee. This sounds fantastic. We set up this service called Buy Me a Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. And people can buy us a coffee? Yeah. It's really just a way for people to support the show if they enjoy the show. And if they're listening to the show, we sure hope you enjoy it. Yeah, otherwise you're just, I mean, wasting your time. <laughs> at buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side, there's three ways that our listeners can interact with the show. Number one, you can just donate to the show by clicking buy them a coffee. Two, you can join as a member for $10 a month or $100 a year. Being a member gains you some pretty cool perks. You get access to our monthly bonus episode, History's B-Side Battles, access to our future episode queue, a name shout out on a future episode. We'll also send you a handwritten thank you postcard and sticker set. And more perks will be announced as we continue on. There's also some different extras that people can get on our Buy Me A Coffee website. 
things like choosing the topic for a future episode. If there's a person, lesser known person in history that you have an interest in, let us know and we'll do an episode all about them. You can also buy sets of custom postcards, sticker sets, and future merchandise that we add on there as well. Or you can draft your own advertisement script and we will promote whatever you want in a segment like this. The website again is buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. Matt? Yeah? You owe me a coffee. Oh. Do I get a coffee too? You're buying. All right. All right, so we've been talking a little bit about Fighting Jack Churchill, or Mad Jack, who is this really interesting soldier from World War II serving for Britain. And already we talked a little bit about how he went into battle carrying only a broadsword, bagpipes, and a longbow, which is really a unique choice for your... Uh, it's the standard soldier's uniform right Yeah, there. your cavalry, your <laughs> armory, or whatever you want to <laughs> call it, I guess. But... Uh, He started his military service in Burma and India, took a little hiatus where he went down to Kenya, filmed a couple movies, took on some modeling jobs, you know, standard stuff for a soldier of the day. (laughs) But now he's about to be called back into service in Britain's army. Right as Britain joins World War II in 1939, Jack Churchill was still a part of the army reserve, so he was called back into service and was placed in the British Expeditionary Force in France. He continued to use his longbow as a part of his military weaponry, believing that the bow was an effective weapon. It was silent and accurate up to 200 yards. He also carried his Scottish broadsword, which was specifically a basket-hilted Claymore medieval sword. I don't know a lot about swords. You probably know more than I do, or at least your dad does. <laughs> My dad does own a couple swords. All I know about this, like the basket hilted, I don't know what claymore means, um, but the basket hilt is like the, the covering over the your hand. The part that goes over your hand. Yeah. So like instead of a, I think if you ask somebody to like draw a medieval sword, they draw a cross, right? With that like... Oh, yeah, yeah. With the hand guard, but it only goes in two directions. But they started... I was actually reading about this when I was looking into trivia questions for you, but they started putting bands from the cross section down to the bottom of the handle to protect the hand. But it started with just one. And like, I think we've all seen swords with like just the one, but as things got more intricate artistically and and craftsman wise, they, you know, ended up with these really ornate basket weave style coverings. And it was, I mean, it's all probably a status symbol. Yeah. And, but it was also meant to protect the hand Yeah, during combat. I just think it's funny because I, I mean, when I was researching this, I came across some pictures of Jack Churchill that we'll have to share on our social media <laughs> feeds when it comes out. But you can see him like holding the sword as he's leading his battalion into combat or whatever. <laughs> like, it's very much a part of his uniform. He really he liked that sword. Held it on him. He was actually famously quoted as saying that any officer who goes into action without his sword is improperly dressed. <laughs> kind of reminds me of... Uh, uh gregor mcgregor a little bit yeah what did he talk about just yeah he got real obsessed with like rank and and insignia dressing a certain way Mm -hmm. to reflect your military status i honestly feel like like let alone the bagpipes we're not even gonna talk about the bagpipes (laughs) but i feel like carrying just the bow and the broadsword would really inhibit my ability to quickly move around during a battle yeah it's just giving me anxiety trying to imagine running (laughs) through like a world war ii battlefield with all this stuff hanging off of me i have to imagine they weren't light like especially the sword right yeah it has to be pretty hefty what he's carrying around but also like i don't know like maybe he just had a very old-fashioned mentality when it came to military service yeah Yeah. that's what you did (laughs) so on may 27th 1940 near the french village of la pinette mad jack led an ambush on a german patrol he actually gave the signal for his unit to attack by raising his broadsword. Of course. And then he killed the first approaching Nazi soldier with a barbed arrow from his longbow from about 30 yards away. So he's Legolas. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> 
This was believed to be the only kill by bow and arrow in World War II, and the last by any British officer in combat. I kind of wish like a British officer today would just like bring a bow and arrow just to get the record. <laughs> this is maybe kind of a morbid thought, but like, <laughs> you know how we make a big deal about like American soldiers that were killed in combat coming home and like rightfully so, but not saying that like, I don't know how Nazi soldiers were handled at the time when they came right. home after being killed in combat. But can you imagine being like the family One of guy. This <laughs> oh, soldier yeah. and they're like he died in combat he was shot by a bow and arrow no that would be terrible <laughs> i didn't know the enemy was using bow and arrows <laughs> they aren't just this one guy <laughs> just the one guy he also killed a guy by breaking his bagpipes in half and stabbing <laughs> him with the pipe <laughs> jeez that's what i would do with a bagpipe at war i don't know what he's doing carrying this thing around i think it was more like a hobby like a understand bagpipe. That, but he brought it to battle <laughs> If I was bringing my saxophone to battle, you better believe it would turn into a bat. I mean, no offense, but bagpipes are quite a bit louder than a saxophone. I don't think anyone would hear a it's saxophone true. on the battlefield, whereas bagpipes they are just wouldn't. like annoying, like a <laughs> whining, Is somebody playing cat. soft jazz in the distance? <laughs> Is there a village still open? So threatening. <laughs> Wham's careless whisper on the battlefield. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, Mad Jack volunteered for the Commandos. This was a British special forces dedicated to carrying out raids against German-occupied areas in Europe. In December of 1941, he was second in command of a commando troop who raided the German storehouses in Vogsay, Norway. He played a rendition of March of the Cameron Men on his bagpipes before throwing a grenade and charging into battle. Naturally. <laughs> Of course. What like what else would you expect? Is he like playing the bagpipes with the grenade in his hand? I have to think. Like <laughs> you know, the bagpipes are designed said, that you bore. blow air into them so you can like not constantly be blowing on them, you can take breaths. So you like fill the bag with air, you're playing your song by releasing the air, and at this time your mouth is free to pull the pin out of the grenade, launch it as you That's charge true. into battle while your bagpipe music is still playing. I'd feel so bad, like you said with the bow and arrow, I'd get I, I would really be upset and embarrassed if I got killed at battle by a guy still playing the bagpipes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's just annoying. It's embarrassing and annoying. It'd be worse to get like amputated so you had to tell the story. How'd that happen? Well, there was this guy running across the battlefield with bagpipes and he was playing them and I didn't see his sword coming. It's kind of a built-in excuse though because bagpipes are like super distracting. Yeah. <laughs> like, where is that sound coming from? Boom! <laughs> For this mission, he earned the Military Cross and Bar Medal after the success of this raid. He was also the commanding officer for a commando operation in Sicily and Salerno in Italy. Matt Jack and a corporal were ordered to capture a German observation post outside of the town of Molina. Armed with only his broadsword, the two men captured 42 German prisoners and a mortar squad. Jeez. Do you know like anything about this? Like, How was he able to capture and maintain 42 people with just a sword? <laughs> I, I mean, this is just another one of those is like... The actual operation wasn't described in a lot of detail. Just every single one said just him and one other guy with only his broadsword captured 42 German soldiers. I feel like if I was in a group of 42 people being held captive by a guy with just a sword, I would definitely convince the others to all bum rush. Him. <laughs> like, I mean, it has to be a sneak attack or sure. something. But like, oh, yeah. I don't know. You, maybe they cornered them somehow. That is pretty embarrassing, though, if you they were kept one of those them all 42 in separate soldiers. Stalls. <laughs> yeah. How'd they get you? It was this psycho guy with a broadsword. <laughs> he had John with the bagpipes. I guess they're German. He had Franz with the bagpipes. <laughs> what? I feel like Franz is a... Franz. Franz. Is that how it would be pronounced in German? Franz. I suppose that's, that's correct. Like Franz. 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 He had Franz with the bagpipes. <laughs> For this operation, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Order... But he actually lost his sword during hand-to-hand -hand combat in Molina. Oh, no. What will he do? So soon after, he returned to retrieve it and along the way ran into a group of American soldiers who were mistakenly heading towards enemy lines. Jack warned them to turn around, but as good American men, they refused to listen. Of course. <laughs> so Mad Jack told them that he was going his own way and wouldn't be returning for a bloody third time. <laughs> Sounds about right. I can imagine him saying that. <laughs> in May of 1944, Mad Jack was now on an operation in Yugoslavia. It's a callback to the Helga Meyer episode. 
different time period. I mean, definitely a way different time period. They weren't running around Yugoslavia at the same time. But. <laughs> he actually hopped in Helga Meyer's Camaro. And I feel like him and Helga Meyer would be a, a, a pretty gruesome team. I think team. so, too. <laughs> they would have been a great yeah, tag they're, team. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna win. They would have won the, the bonus episode super fights. <laughs> Jumping in the little time machine here, it was actually Mad Jack and Helga Meyer who rounded up 42 German soldiers <laughs> and with just a broadsword <laughs> and a Camaro. Camaro is a time machine. Yes. Yeah. The like like the DeLorean in, yes. in Back to the Future. <laughs> this is where we take a little bit of liberties with history on our podcasts. And, yeah. But everything else is true. Mad Jack exactly. is a very real guy, despite the fact that his we story said. sounds so <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> As does Helga Myers. I feel like they, yeah, they are like the, the crazy twins of <laughs> the podcast <laughs> of History's B-Side. If we need some like mascots for our yeah. show. So, in 1944, Mad Jack is now in Yugoslavia. They were actually ambushed by German soldiers at this time who launched a mortar shell that killed or wounded his entire unit. So, sad part of the story. Churchill was actually in the middle of playing the song Will Ye No Come Back Again on his bagpipes when he was knocked <laughs> unconscious God. in the attack. <laughs> he was, Of course. <laughs> he was captured and flown to Berlin for interrogation because the German soldiers believe that he might be related to Winston Churchill, just based oh, on his name. Okay. <laughs> okay. So they they soon found out that he wasn't actually related, that he wasn't the prized prisoner that they thought they had captured. Uh, but he was transferred to the Suckenhosen concentration camp. A few days there, though, and Mad Jack and a Royal Air Force officer named Bertram James tunneled their way out of the concentration <laughs> camp. Uh, of course he did. To escape. He had a shovel in his bagpipes. <laughs> Probably. No, just used his sword like a shovel and dug his way out. Sword. Because I'm sure they let him keep his sword while he was in the concentration yeah. camp. Yeah, and his bagpipes. <laughs> We're sitting there imagining he's just sitting there with bagpipes, a bow and arrow, and a sword. a sad song on his bagpipes in the concentration camp. <laughs> it's like, camp. A, like the prisoners with the harmonica. Yeah. <laughs> it's a much louder. Yeah. <laughs> the pair made it almost to the Baltic coast on foot, but they were recaptured near Rostock, Germany. Then he was transferred to Tyrol with other high-profile Nazi prisoners. At this point, he was a lieutenant colonel in the British Army, so he was pretty high-ranking, pretty good capture for them. But the the whole group was eventually released on May 4th, 1945, after they, they were liberated by American soldiers. See, it was probably the same soldiers he warned in Italy. <laughs> they came back for him. <laughs> Mad Jack then walked 93 miles to Verona, Italy, where he met up with a group of American soldiers. Jesus, 93 miles. I actually read that it was believed he walked that way with a broken foot, too. Oh, my God. <laughs> was he playing with the bagpipes the entire time? Probably. Let's be honest. That would be a great movie. <laughs> Bagpiping to Italy. This guy was just crazy. <laughs> His final assignment of World War II was to Burma. So back where he started where some of the larger land battles against Japan were being fought. While he was on the way there, the U.S. had bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, actually before Churchill arrived, which effectively ended World War II. Churchill himself was actually kind of disappointed at the sudden end of the war. <laughs> he was quoted as saying, If it wasn't for those damn Yanks, we could have kept the war going another ten years. Yeah, how unfortunate that the war had to end early and we couldn't have another 10 years of death and suffering. <laughs> Not that I guess like two dropped atomic bombs is like a solid I mean, all right. option. Maybe we should have a little conversation that, about that. World War II because <laughs> I do feel like, of course, there was some celebration about the war ending. Right. But I mean, at what cost? Like, that's not a great way for... No. To end when, war. You know what? I actually, this is going to directly disagree with what he said, but I've read and seen in two different places that it's likely that the Japanese would have lost without the bombs. Oh, I'm sure. Um, so it was almost just like an overkill yeah, reason yeah, to think? test them out. <laughs> I mean, it was definitely overkill, let's be clear. But it, it was like just purely a reason to test out the the bombs and yeah. see how they worked in in a live situation but great human test subjects <laughs> sorry japan we're friends now 
I guess. Does yeah. not justify nuclear warfare, just yeah. for our listeners. Trump and Abe love to golf all the time. I, I, I'm... <laughs> I'm certain Trump doesn't listen to our podcast, so we're not encouraging anything. Oh, that's disappointing. I thought we uh, might have a high-profile listener. (laughs) (laughs) But I don't think, I mean, I don't think Mad Jack's disappointment had anything to do with, you know, wanting necessarily the war to keep going. It was just that he had such a lust for adventure and action right. that well you said like when he wasn't serving in the army he was bored so he yeah. like he was having the time of his life it was his element I, I mean clearly the guy was how many countries was he in he was in norway italy burma india yeah. uh yugoslavia like england kenya this guy was all over the place and now it's just kind of like the the means to all his traveling is over and he's probably just gonna have to go back to england and wait for the next war (laughs) so after the war ended mad jack really wasn't done with his adventures still of course he wasn't he became a parachutist with the (laughs) seaforth highlanders And he was assigned to British-occupied Palestine, where he trained soldiers to defend the area against attacks from Arab forces. Hmm. So, still in the military, still very active, still doing some crazy things. In the spring of 1948, his unit actually helped defend and coordinate the evacuation of 700 Jewish doctors, students, and patients from armed insurgents in the Hadassah Medical Convoy Massacre. Very active, active combat, and saving a lot of lives in doing so. After he retired from active duty, Mad Jack moved to Australia, where he became a military school instructor and learned how to surf. Honestly, when I was like going through your outline, I wasn't surprised at all (laughs) that he learned to surf. I was like, this guy's going to do. Yeah, nothing surprising about him anymore. But also, what else are you going to do when you're in Australia and semi retired? You're going to teach what you know and learn how to surf. (laughs) <laughs> i go hang out with kangaroos that's probably not true i would definitely try to learn how to surf too <laughs> i mean this guy is just like unbelievable yeah. how much stuff he learned how to do he actually used his surfing skills when he returned to england he became the first person to ride the river severn's tidal bore what is a tidal bore i don't even know what that is it's kind of like a a very specific wave system is the best mm. way to like describe it it doesn't produce necessarily huge waves, but it's a small wave that can form inside of a river. I think it was only okay. five to ten feet or so. Gotcha. But probably a pretty difficult surf. <laughs> Clearly, he's the first one to do it, and of course, it would be him. Back in England, he worked a desk job for the Army until his official retirement in 1959 at the age of 53. He also appeared as a background in character in another film by mgm it was the 1952 film ivanhoe that brings him up to three movie appearances i believe in this one he just appeared as an archer from the top of a building so again using some of the skills that he knew he also as a hobby would refurbish and sail coal-powered steamboats on the thames and he played with radio controlled model warships and of course he Continued motorcycling, one of his he's like, earlier hobbies. He's like history's version of an adventure junkie. Pretty much. I feel like this guy just can't sit still and would just be yeah. bored. <laughs> he has to go do it. It's also noted that every day on his train ride home from his desk job or just in retirement whenever he was in the city and riding home, he would startle train guards and passengers by just throwing his briefcase out the window <laughs> randomly. <laughs> Every day? Every day. He threw his briefcase out the window. Yep. Did he go back and get it? Right out the window. Well, when people asked him why he was doing that, he explained that he was just simply tossing it into his backyard so he didn't have to carry it home from the train station. (laughs) My God. I wonder if that's true. Like, I have to believe that that's true, that he just lived close enough to the railroad that he could throw his briefcase into his backyard. But also, did he miss? Ever? Ever? I don't know. I mean, how close was his backyard to the train tracks? I mean, if his story is true, it must have been pretty close. Yeah. I can't imagine you can throw it that far out the window I mean, yeah, of a like, train. It, yeah, it couldn't have been very far. <laughs> can you imagine that, though? <laughs> <laughs> Some guy just chucking his suitcase out the window. <laughs> what the? It's good. It's my backyard. Don't worry about it. It's fine. My wife got it. Just didn't want to carry it home. <laughs> we also didn't mention this, but he married Rosamund Margaret Denny on March 8th, 1941. 
The couple had two sons, Malcolm John Leslie Churchill and Rodney Alistair Gladstone Churchill. These are all very British names. Yes, they are. <laughs> Alistair <laughs> Gladstone Churchill at your service. <laughs> they all have very, like, four names. <laughs> Malcolm described his father as a peace-loving and unassuming man. Another one of his famous quotes was that people are less likely to shoot you if you smile at them. Which is probably true. I feel like he was the kind of guy, like, on the battlefield, he's, like, playing his bagpipes, he's got a sword and his bow. I feel like he, like, if you were close hand combating him, he would have been, like, messing with you verbally. <laughs> he would be like, come on, chap, that's the best you got. <laughs> no, it'd probably be more complimentary, like, great swing, you almost got me on that one. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen a, um, The Princess Bride? Oh, years ago. A I, long time. I actually just watched it for the first time like last month, which is sad that it's the first time I've seen it. But he reminds me of the the guy in that where he's like comical yeah. while he's fighting. <laughs> I have to imagine that's how he was. <laughs> and honestly, it even reminds me of I don't I mean you're a Steelers fan. I don't know if you've heard this or not, but uh famous Steelers receiver Heinz Ward used to always oh, say yeah. that whenever he got hit especially hard, he would pop right back up and smile at the yep. defender who hit him just to like show that didn't, didn't hurt him. Rattled, like, yeah. he didn't get him that good. Like, this is, I guess, the opposite. He's smiling to not Freaking get shot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that would make people, like, friendlier or just be, like... <laughs> what is this crazy guy doing out here? Psycho. He's, he's really loving this. There's, like, bullets whizzing past. <laughs> or he maybe just was having a really good time. He didn't want the war to end. <laughs> Jack Churchill did die on March 8th, 1996, at the age of 89, which I believe would have been his 55th wedding anniversary, if we're hmm. doing that math right. So, interesting. Yeah. Very interesting guy. Uh, obviously lived a very full, adventurous life. So, <laughs> would be cool if he was still one of our living B-siders, but we yeah. missed that cut just a little bit. But, like you said, cool story. Probably would have got along, got along with Helga Meyer if they're at the same time I think, in history. I think they would have. Kind of similar to that style of episode where it's not like, we needed to get into a whole discussion on the historical event. He's not like right. necessarily someone that led to a huge chain event in history, but just a cool story that was you might not have known if you weren't listening to a podcast about lesser known people. <laughs> you ready for your quiz? I have no idea what it's going to be about. I think you'll be all right. I don't think so. I think two of the questions you'll be fine on. One is kind of hard, but you can infer some of the answers to it. Great. Let's infer some answers. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, you're about to listen to History's B-Side, but normally I would say, ladies and gentlemen, this is What Should I Do the Podcast? Because I'm Scotty Brandon, my partner Brandon is with me, and we're going to tell you all about our podcast, but in a very, very abbreviated version, because we want you to come over and listen. You're about to listen to Wonders of the Past right here on History's B-Side. But why don't you check out What Should I Do, the podcast, if you're looking for some personal and professional development in your life. People of all industries have been on our show. We're weekly, and you can find us wherever podcasts are available. If you want to come over and have some fun, listen to other people's stories and their challenges, and maybe grow through exactly what they share, as well as play some fun games, come check out What Should I Do, the podcast. We're going to have some fun, and we hope to see you there. Now enjoy History's B-Side. All right, welcome back. So as many of you might know, we like to end every episode by asking our host a series of questions in a short quiz just to see how much he researched his topic and also to give our listeners a chance to have a little bit of fun and see what they might know about uh, the history that we cover. So I couldn't find a ton of questions about Jack Churchill himself. I have one, but um, the other two are about, fittingly, bagpiping and archery. Oh, gosh. Um but yeah, I think I think you'll do fine. They're not. I, I didn't try to make them hard. I feel like we always say that, like, yeah, you'll you'll get this. You got this. No, we don't get we, it. Yeah, we get like you actually maybe like, one right towards the end of the episode mentioned one of my questions, oh, I which I got I got worried about. But you didn't say anything about the answer. So um, we'll start off with that one. Actually, 
And I wasn't planning on including it, but since you mentioned it, I, I kind of want to see if you know. Great. Um, so we'll start with that one. And, and today's episode will have four questions. Bonus question. So you mentioned right at the end there that he had a background role in the film Ivanhoe from MGM in 1952. Uh, and his role was shooting an arrow off the top of a building, as you said. Can you name the building? Oh, I just read it. <laughs> it's in England, right? It is. Um, I have no idea. I would, if I'm going to just make a guess, is it like, I don't know, Buckingham Palace? It was close. It's Warwick. Warwick okay. Castle. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I threw that question out because it was like in the Wikipedia article and I assumed you had read it. But I just... I don't work off Wikipedia, Matt. What kind of podcast do you think Well, that's fair. Is? I just... I always scan through the Wikipedia thing just to see I if know, it... I Wikipedia is a great resource for our podcast. <laughs> Not the only one we use. This isn't an academic help. journal, Phil. <laughs> so I just figured I'd include that question just for the fun of it. But yeah, Warwick Castle, he was pictured shooting an arrow off the top of it. Interesting. And the, the movie actually also starred his, He's one of his rowing friend. Yeah, one of his friends. For your second question, you mentioned Jack participating in the world champ- the archery world championships. Over the years, the world archery championships have been held in five U.S. cities. Can you name them? No. This is your hardest question. <laughs> Jeez. Um, Two of them are super obvious and the other three are definitely not. New York. Chicago. Okay, so L.A. Mm-hmm. New York and L.A. Um... For some reason, I want to say Orlando. No. Hmm. Can you give me a state? Or three? Nevada. <laughs> Vegas? Yes. Obviously. The, in, the indoor, in in the, in the indoor ones. Reno could have held them. Okay. <laughs> uh, the other two states are... I'm going to be in, uh, like kind of embarrassed. I don't know where one of these is. I think I do, but I don't for a fact. One is in South Dakota. Bismarck. It's not a big city. It's <laughs> Yankton, South Dakota. Yep, never heard of never it in a thousand that. years. <laughs> I saw it like three different times on the archery world. They must have like an archery range there or something because it was it showed up like three different times. And I was like, what the hell is Yankton? <laughs> the other one is Valley Forge, which I think is in Pennsylvania, but I don't I don't know mm. where Valley Forge is, which is pathetic. Yeah, like that's one of those that you <laughs> know the place. We're a history like, podcast. We should know. Put this on a map. I feel like it's in Pennsylvania, but... Let's find out. It is Pennsylvania. Yes, it is. So after some research, we found that Valley Forge is, in fact, in Pennsylvania. (laughs) For all our history buffs out there. (laughs) Really exposing ourselves here. We said over and over again, we're not historians. We're just normal guys. Yeah. The quiz section is really just kind (laughs) of off the wall, showing how little we actually know. All right, so for your third question, we talked about him playing the bagpipes. Now, these days, bagpipes are made from a synthetic fabric, but traditionally, they were made out of what? Uh, Is it like some kind of a lamb skin or like an animal, pro- like a... Is it a skin or is it like a stomach? Yeah, it's a skin. It's a you're yeah, you're <laughs> like you're like goat skin? It's it's the entire skin of an animal, usually a sheep. Okay. So but that's pretty close. Here's the the reason I wanted to ask this was to explain that the legs and neck were used to insert the pipes. Uh. Which sounds so gross, but I have to say when I read that, it made the layout of a bagpipe make so much more sense. Yeah, but that's still just gross super gross (laughs) super gross but i totally understand why bagpipes look the way they do if that's the case okay do you know like (laughs) when they started making modern bagpipes like was jack churchill using an old lamb carcass i imagine not i kind of i this is completely like my own imaginings but i feel like the 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 sheepskin bagpipes were a medieval thing (laughs) I don't even know when bagpipes were started, though. I mean, they have to be super old. Like, yeah. Ancient times. 
on next week's History's B-Side, the inventor of the bagpipes. <laughs> hey, maybe. Or or we could do like a, a Lizzie Maggi situation. The true inventor of the bagpipes. We haven't done a good like music episode yet. No, we haven't. That should be a future coming soon episode. You ready for your final question? I just found an article titled, Who Really Invented the Bagpipes? Oh so my God, really? really yeah, that could, Lizzie I made a joke style. about the La- Lizzie Maggi thing, but we could definitely do yeah. that. <laughs> Who really invented the bagpipes? So for all of his accomplishments and awards. I forgot we had a bonus question. There is a bonus question. Oh, geez. You're not off the hook yet. Crap. There is a street named after Jack called Churchill Boulevard. What country is it in? Are you sure it's not named after Winston Churchill? Because they're yes, one hundred percent. No, it is. <laughs> it's specifically there might be Churchill Boulevard in Britain. It's not named after Jack, and I guess that's your first hint because it's not in Britain. Okay, so we just tried to rattle off all the countries he was in. Okay, my initial guess would have been Burma, which there's probably a conversation in there as to whether it's Burma or Myanmar because I don't know what we're supposed to call it today, but. In his time, it was Burma. Mm-hmm. Every article said Burma. So we're calling it Burma. Um, I'm going to guess that it is in Palestine, like modern day Palestine, because of the medical convoy massacre that he was a hero in. Yeah, you're right. That was a good, good nice. call. Yeah, it's in Jerusalem. It leads actually to, it's the boulevard leading to the hospital. Oh, wow. Awesome. So... Cool. That was good. Nice job. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to the crazy story of Mad Jack Churchill. Feel free to let us know what you think. If this guy is too good to be true, but everything (laughs) I read says that he's real as can be. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, feel free to contact us, historiesbside at gmail.com. Follow us on social media. Share the show with your friends. Give us a rating or review if you'd like. And thanks for listening. History's B-Side is an independent, listener-supported podcast. Leave us a review or subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting service. And follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at History's B-Side. Send us your feedback or inquire about sponsorship and advertising opportunities by emailing us at historiesbside at gmail.com. You can donate to the show at buymeacoffee.com slash historiesbside. While you're there, check out our membership perks, merchandise, and more. This episode was researched and produced by your hosts, Matt Melito and Phil Hall. Thanks for listening to History's B-Side.